start to, um, they have to try and expand what they're doing, is skills they want to girls as well. And girls start to drop out of school to uh, help their mothers with the unpaid work. So, although it may be a way of coping with the immediate pressure of the crisis, it's not something that's good for gender equality. Also, it uh, also actually tends to intensify the recession. If you think about it, if I make clothes at home, there's less demand for people to be employed making clothes for me. If I make meals at home, I'm not going to be buying from those street vendors. Um, so what's a safety net for one household reduces the incomes of the other household. And uh, this is an example of what um, economists uh, sometimes called the paradox of thrift. In a recession, a common and quite a rational response for each individual household is to become more thrifty, to save more. One way you save more is buying less and making more yourself at home. Uh, but this actually deepens the recession for other people. It has a multiplier effect that spreads the recession further. So as well as celebrating it as a coping strategy, we need to remember that. So I think this signals the need for measures that maintain the purchasing power of low-income women. And I'll be saying a little bit more about what those might be. Um, particularly focusing on low-income women, because there is a lot of e uh, evidence that women tend to spend their money differently from men, and that they tend to spend it more uh, on goods that benefit other members of the household. Even bearing those things in mind, then, I said, yes, it, yes, it can be an invisible safety net. Yes, it can well be an intensified gender inequality. And yes, it's an intensified recession. But I think it's also important to recognize that the invisible safety net's probably got a lot of holes in it. There is a limit to what you can, how far you can get by without having money. People, uh, live in money, heavily monetized economies now throughout the developing world. And uh, I've got the um, um, quotation illustrating the kind of stress and tension. This is a South African woman, street trader, saying actually she can't get by without money. She has to have money uh, to care for her grandchildren. And so what happens then? Well, the we go study reports uh, that people just start reducing um, their intake of food, they cut back their meals for themselves, for their children. And the Oxfam study I referred to earlier tells the same story, and I picked out their quotation, which illustrates the adverse impacts there are on health, uh, <coughs> cutting back on food. Um, other responses may be borrowing more money to try and tide yourself over at very high rates of interest from loan sharks, uh, selling remaining assets um, for women's uh, asset, the way they kept their savings together in many countries is uh, some kind of gold jewelry. <coughs> you have to get out your gold bangles that you brought to uh, heritage for your mother gave you when you got married and uh, pawn them or even sell them completely. Uh, and there are uh, worries that um, also um, women will be pressured to turn into sex work because sex work there, especially international sex work, there may still be a market. So there are no goals in the safety net that can be provided by domestic unpaid work. And um, I, I think the big worry, I think, it's about the, the crisis, how it affects people in developing countries, is that there will be adverse impacts that are irreversible. It won't be a matter of we lost our job, we were poor for two years, but then we found some jobs again and we got back on our feet again. There can be irreversible impacts. Um, children dropping out of school and never going back again. An increase in child labour. Children malnourished, remember those cutbacks in meals. Uh, wasting and stunting. There is now uh, quite a lot of evidence to show how um, wasting and stunting in children uh, affects their capacity to learn and has long-lasting long effects throughout their lives on their, on their health and um, their capacity to learn. And gender norms in many countries, I mean the girls 
are likely to work worse affected than boys. That's not true of all countries, uh, but in the big arc round from probably from North Africa around through to China, uh, gender norms are such that it, these are more likely to affect than girls and boys. There's a strong song preference for all kinds of social and economic reasons that uh, we can go into discussion if people want to. Um, also, uh, irreversible adverse impacts, uh, because when women are malnourished, complications in pregnancy are more likely, maternal mortality is likely to go up, uh, as women are likely to be more low birth weight babies. And the bottom line for people is that people die prematurely. And I quote you there, the World Bank uh, estimate of the, the increases in the number of deaths annually uh, driven by increasing malnutrition, um, projections for increases in maternal mortality rates, um, quite likely to be increases in alcohol and violence related deaths among men. Uh, not mention the crisis of the transition, following the transition to the market. Uh, in some parts of the former Soviet Union, but one of the things we saw there was a rise in male mortality rates, very much linked to uh, uh, alcohol and violence related deaths among men, also rises in suicide rates. Um, so, that irreversible adverse impacts far beyond anything we're going to see in rich countries. So, when we go from here, let me um, move on to uh, what we can do to respond and what we can try and press policy makers to do. Uh, the first, I think, is recognising the role of unpaid domestic work in the crisis. Problems of timely monitoring. Lots of countries do have timely surveys here. Canada was one of the pioneers, but lots of developing countries also have them but they take place once every five years. Uh, compare that with the kind of data that we have on financial markets. Um, there is going to be set up a new UN Global Impact and Vulnerability Alert System to try and get more rapid data on some of these human dimensions of the crisis. And I was online this afternoon just checking to see is there anything firmed up yet about exactly what they're going to collect and they don't seem to have firmed it up yet. So I don't know whether they're going to include anything about unpaid work in that. Uh, but I'm not altogether hopeful because they have just published a new report called Voices of the Vulnerable uh, which tries to put together, much as I have done, the scattered bits of information we've got about how is this crisis really affecting people. It mentions quite a few of the things that I've talked about, but doesn't mention unpaid work and the implications of uh, overburdening uh, women with unpaid work in that. <coughs> I also think there are opportunities for women-led grassroots monitoring of the impact of the crisis through sentinel sites. In other words, not something that covers the whole country as the representative, but you choose uh, some key villages, some key districts in the, in the capital city, a few medium-sized towns, and you work uh, with organizations at grassroots level. I've developed a sort of set of 10 questions, because 10 seemed to a nice round number, that you could use in a discussion uh, in a women's group to try and, try and um, tease out what are the experiences that they're reporting, or they're saying their family or their friends have had, not just on the loss of jobs or violence remittances, but on these uh, less visible aspects. And that's been, Oxfam is quite interested in that, so that will come out in the next Oxfam uh, Gender and Development Journal. And I think this, is, this will be a great, actually I think it's an opportunity for women's organisations everywhere uh, to try and do some bottom-up monitoring about what are the kinds of things that are affecting uh, their members and as a way of trying to make more visible what is still going on. Um, 